Your bits are rotting away and you don't even know it. Well, Synology's here to help with that. Eight three and a half inch drives in a box, plus a box of cables. Let's take a look. You losing all your data? It is the darkest timeline after all. Rocking an OCZ Agility 3, <laughs> some of the first two and a half inch SATA drives since 120 gig SATA 3. I mean, this is pretty old. Uh, these have all died. Darn near all of them. So if you've got one of these, you're on borrowed time. What if I told you, you could buy a box, plug it into your network, set it up one time, basically forget about it, and every time you're not using your computer, it's being backed up. It's being backed up locally. So it's backing up at wire speed or as fast as your wireless network possibly is. So if it's like 802.11 AC and you know, like 400 megabit, it's gonna back up at 400 megabit. That's pretty much what you get with a Synology NAS. And this is not the first Synology NAS that I've taken a look at. We've actually done a lot of videos. Surveillance station, you can set one of these up with IP cameras, DIY it, there's no subscription cost or anything like that. These things will run two cameras for free. After that, you gotta pay for a license, but that's some really good stuff. You can combine that with something like the Ingenious Power over Ethernet switches and have a really killer surveillance system with cameras. But it can also back up all of your documents. You can also run virtual machines. We looked at running virtual machines and doing some really cool cloud connected stuff. You can run Next Cloud and some other things. You gotta be a little bit careful when you put that on the internet because you wanna do a little bit of application filtering, you wanna do a little bit of firewalling, you wanna do a little bit of work to make sure that your applications are gonna update seamlessly because if you don't, eventually, um, you're not gonna update an application. It's gonna have a security issue. And then everybody's, you know, gonna be mining Bitcoin on your on your NAS. And most of the ones that I've looked at before are really big, but I really can't stress enough that these appliances are great for sort of set it and forget it backups. And they're also available in very small configurations. You can have one that's just two hard drives, a very basic mirror where you've got two mechanical drives that mirror one another. Those don't really have a lot of CPU horsepower for fancy things like you know running a home lab or virtual machines or anything like that. This one, this is the DS1821 Plus. So the way that Synology does their model numbers, you should know that that means it's got eight three and a half inch bays. First, you've got your Synology quick installation guide because when you pick up one of these, you're also gonna have to pick up your own hard drives or your own SSDs or some combination. And not just any SSD will do, you're gonna want a NAS grade SSD at least. I mean, uh, we did the other video on that where we tested one of these to failure using a software program called Anvil. Um, these SSDs lasted for about 4.5 petabytes in the best case scenario. So it'll handle 4.5 petabytes of writes. And it depends on the capacity too, because the smaller the capacity, the less the less writing that you have. But the one that's around a terabyte. So we've got 400 gig for this NVMe, the Synology NVMe. This is a Fison based microcontroller. There are four flash chips on this PCB. And again, the name of the game here is Endurance. You have the two and a half inch SATA one as well. It's pretty, feels pretty heavy. Doesn't necessarily mean anything, but the name of the game is Endurance. It's going to last. They also have a, a nice Synology warranty to go along with it. So it's like, that's why you would do that. Now when you're picking hard drives, there's some things that you ought to know about picking hard drives for these things. One, you're gonna want a NAS rated hard drive. I know the temptation is to get the cheapest hard drive that you can possibly imagine, but you shouldn't do that. If you're gonna cheap out, you should just shuck your hard drive. Yeah, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes it's cheaper to buy an external hard drive than it is to buy an internal hard drive. And sometimes the external hard drives are the same, you know, NAS reliability drives. The problem is that if you buy an external hard drive, it's in a USB enclosure. And when you take it apart, they're not gonna honor the warranty on the drive, which really kind of sucks. So you're throwing the warranty out. But sometimes you can save upwards of $100 per drive, especially if we're talking about capacities that are, you know, 10, 12, 14 terabytes per drive. That's nothing to sneeze at. It's, it's a nice to have that, that level of capacity. There was a little bit of a kerfuffle you should be aware of on some of the lower capacity drives, so like two terabytes, four terabytes, things like that. For writing information to them, they use what's called SMR, shingled magnetic recording. We did a separate video on that. If you're worried about buying the wrong thing, you should definitely watch that because that'll, that'll, that'll get you clued in. But generally you want NAS rated drives because they're rated to be on and operational 24 hours a day. Uh, the desktop class drives are typically only rated, the motor is only rated to be on about eight hours a day. So they'll you know, die in three years. You can pretty much set your watch by it. So I've used Seagate, Iron Wolf, pretty good. 
Also use the helium filled WD red drives. Those are also pretty good. So pick up a NAS uh, class of hard drive for your NAS. Now another rule that's important to understand is capacity. Because as the hard drive capacities have gone up, the data transfer rates have not gone up. So the data transfer rate of a four terabyte hard drive is roughly the same, it's close, since within spinning distance of a 14 or 16 terabyte hard drive. So if something dies and you have to, and you, you're, you know, your storage is half full, let's say you've got uh, 16 terabyte drives and all of, you know, the, the entire thing, the entire capacity of the NAS is full, which is gonna be more than the capacity of any, any single drive. Um, you're gonna have to write half of that drive. And if you're writing half of that drive at roughly 200 megabytes per second, it could take a day. It could take longer if it's not an ideal situation as it often is. So as a strategy, if you have a lot of mechanical hard drives, you should probably have multiple layers of redundancy, multiple extra drives. So this is eight, eight drives. If you're gonna fully fill this up, I recommend that you use two, maybe three drives for redundancy. So you'll only have five or six drives worth of capacity. Now, to be sure, the pedantic among you have probably already started typing comments, but the parity information and the redundancy information is spread evenly across all of those drives. It's not like you have a single parity drive or a dedicated parity drive or anything like that. So for air configuration, I'm gonna go with WD Red, helium filled, because there's there's the non-helium filled version and the helium filled version. WD Red for this, and that's what we're gonna use for our initial setup. But the real magic with this SSD, it's under the hood. We gotta pop the top. All right, so internally we reveal a little bit more of the mystery, the mystery that's going on here. So our unit is equipped with a single four gigabyte DIMM. We will be upgrading that. It's a DDR4 2666 four gig ECC. So this is an error correcting DIMM, which is very nice. Remember on some of the other models that we reviewed previously, it wasn't necessarily an error correcting DIMM. This one is an error correcting DIMM. And do you know why it's an error correcting DIMM? It's because the processor in this is Ryzen. Yeah, Ryzen. So we can put up to 32 gigabytes in this thing via two 16 gig ECC DIMMs. That's on my short, short shopping list. All right, so on this side, this is pretty much the only thing interesting you can see with the cover off. You got a PCI Express by eight slot. Now Synology has an accessory that's a 10 gig network plus M.2 slots, which is awesome. But this thing actually has onboard M.2. So you don't have to use the expansion slot for M.2 if you don't want to. This is super easy. Know what I like about these trays? They're toolless. You just pop your hard drive in, you're good to go. With our drive trays removed, you can see the M.2 slots, they're over here on the side. It's PCI Express by eight connection, so by four by four for your two M.2s. They just snap right in, that is a toolless installation. The nice thing about this M.2 placement is that you get airflow. You see there's these two giant fans on the back and they don't really spin that fast. So this is a device that's designed to be on top of your desktop. Here, have a listen. So that sound profile is with drives installed, plus this thing up and doing stuff. Now, to be sure, if you hit it really hard, it is gonna ramp the fans, and it is gonna do a lot of uh, stuff to try to bring the internal temperature down. So be aware that it can run a little louder than that, depending on the ambient operating uh, environment that you're in. If you're in a warmer room, the fans are gonna have to ramp up, that kind of thing. But if it's not really super busy, the fans are gonna ramp down, you're barely gonna hear it, which is a nice feature. In terms of IO ports, you've got one USB 3, five gigabit port at the front here. You might miss it, but it's easy. <laughs> it's, it's right there, it's easy to miss, but you know, be aware of it. At the back, we've got two eSATA ports. Those are for connecting more SATA hard drives. You could actually do another enclosure. Synology makes another enclosure that you could daisy chain into this one if you need more physical hard drives. We've also got three USB ports, and then we've got four one gig ports. And the really cool thing about this is you can just plug in those multiple one gig ports and get a speed benefit. If SMB multi-channel is not working for you for some reason, we did a whole other video on that, all that still applies. It did seem to work better for me when I remoted into this thing to enable SMB multi-channel um, and, and tweak some of the settings, but out of the box, I was getting a performance benefit from just plugging in multiple one gig NICs for all of the different stuff that I was doing between VM backups, and local SMB connections and everything else that it was trying to juggle. Pretty much the only reason that you'd need to remove the top is to install that 10 gig networking card 
and your you know additional m.2 so this thing you could really have it kitted out with four m.2 ports which is kind of nuts in a, in a in a maximally configured sort of scenario i mean at that point you're basically running a pc i mean it's embedded it's embedded ryzen so i mean of course in terms of the specific hardware config that we're dealing with on the ryzen side of the world there's a ryzen 1500b so you know if you're a follower of nas appliances this replaces the intel atom intel atom had some problems with stuff dying and then the warranty ended and then they would replace it and then it would just die again the same way. It's nice to see Ryzen embedded in here. Let's 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 stay positive. Ryzen embedded, that's good. Four cores, eight threads, but don't expect too much. That's still a 16 watt TDP. But if you want a quiet machine that's gonna run on your desktop efficiently and well and for years to come, I'm not sure you want something that runs hot. It's just, just gonna be loud. 16 watts is really easy to cool with two giant fans. So. Good job Synology. Now the other reason that you buy a chassis like this is the software. The Synology software is the special sauce. It's Linux under the hood, so that means it's gonna support things like Linux MD multi-disc, which is pretty tried and true, pretty battle hardened. It'll support BTRFS if you're into BTRFS or ButterFS. It's a sort of resilient healing, you know, redundant file system. The way that it runs BTRFS is it runs BTRFS on top of some other stuff to handle the multi-disc redundancy. So what BTRFS is good for is detecting bit rot. This is definitely the easy button solution. Synology has invested large mountains of cash, I'm sure, in making their user interface as simple and easy as possible. It's very easy to add external applications. If you wanna, for example, mirror this Synology to another Synology somewhere else, it's really easy to do. That's what I'm planning to do with this. I'm planning to outfit this with some really large drives and use this as an offsite mirror for some of the stuff that level one is doing. So this is this is a pretty good chassis for that. And uh, the software platform, because it's Linux, well, if you wanna go off script and SSH into it and, and do stuff at the command line, you can because it's, it's basically a glorified desktop PC. The only thing it leaves me wanting for is you know, some kind of a video console port or something like that, that I could just, you know, basically use it as a Linux computer. But I don't think most people would use it that way. So, you know, I get leaving off the video connection because most, most people don't need that. And the magic of the Synology App Center means that even though Linux is your base, you can add on a ton of other functionality. Now, I already mentioned surveillance, but if you don't you know, have another NAS device that you're backing up to, you can back up to Amazon, you can back up to Glacier, you can back up to Synology's own subscription service, which I reviewed previously and is quite good. It's a good deal for the amount of capacity that you get. So you can say, create a one terabyte share off of this of like your most important, super critical stuff and use the Synology backup service and back up just that one terabyte of really critical like family photos and your finance stuff, whatever you consider to be the most important, it'll encrypt it with a password, and it'll encrypt it in such a way that Synology can't help you decrypt it if you forget your password. So you set a password, and then if you need to restore a backup or something like that from the Synology cloud, you're gonna have to give them the password, or you're gonna have to reset up one of these and put the password in, because when it pulls that backup down, it's not gonna be able to restore it without the password, which is pretty awesome that you know they have your data, but they can't do anything with it without the password. There's a whole universe of other applications beyond file sharing, beyond everything else. One of them, Home Assistant. We've been doing all these IoT videos, and right now I'm running Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi, and I've got a USB device that plugs into the Raspberry Pi to provide you know, a Z-Wave and Zigbee network interface. Well, how are you gonna do that in a virtual machine in a NAS? Well, they thought of that. Their software actually makes it point and click for me to pass through a USB port on a virtual machine running on this NAS. On a Raspberry Pi, I had to um, cause it's inside a Docker container. I had to jump through a couple of hoops to map the serial port on the host to a serial port inside a Docker container. So it was command line, spooky voodoo magic. It really wasn't hard. And actually there's a how to on the Linux level one forums. But with this, it was point and click. I didn't have to do anything. It was right in the dropdown menu. Good job, Synology. So I could put my, you know, Z, Z Wave Zigbee USB adapter in one of these USB three ports, map it to a virtual machine and I was good to go. The other thing is Home Lab. So let's talk about Home Lab for a second. This thing, especially with a faster network interface for iSCSI and as a backing store for VMware, it works really well. So if you want a Home Lab with one of these, I mean, the commercial use and like officially supported, like when you get into like your commercial VMware support, you really gotta dot the I's and cross the T's to not make your life more complicated than it needs to be. But for Home Lab, let me show you something. This is my Dan Case A4 machine, eight cores, 
and a bunch of RAM. Then I've got my Intel NUC that I reviewed a while ago. Now this is the fancy NUC that's a PCIe card, and I've got two PCI Express slots here. I can run two PCI Express by eight devices in this, no problem. I've got Thunderbolt, dual Intel NIC. This one also has dual Intel NIC. So right here, I've got 16 cores of compute, four cores of storage, and I can run a VMware cluster because the witness appliance is running on this as a VM. I create the witness appliance in VMware and then I use the backup facility in the Synology because the Synology is VMware aware. It can interface with uh, VMware, even the free version of ESXi. And I can pull that uh, witness appliance for the cluster to the Synology and actually boot it up on the Synology. And then I can have my virtual machines running in both places, vSAN over the network, have the images stored here. And then if I lose either one of these nodes for my you know, home lab compute system, the other node will just spin up all of the virtual machines that went down when I lost another node. But 16 cores and 32 threads in just the desktop space that you see here really is incredible for a home lab. I mean, if you're talking about apartment home lab and you don't mind spending a little money, this is really a lot of fun and it's a good learning thing. So like if you're getting into computers and you want to learn virtual machines and software defined infrastructure and stuff like that, a setup like this is pretty killer. So there you have it. That's been a quick look at the Synology DS1821 Plus and all the different stuff that you can do with it. And actually you can do even more with it than I went over in the video. But my fantasy configuration, two NVMe for caching, eight eight terabyte hard drives, 10 gig NIC, we're off to the races. And don't worry, there's a separate video coming with the 10 gig M.2 installation with this very chassis. So we'll take a look at that and some of the performance implications of that. But I'm always really impressed with the fit and finish and the build quality from Synology and their software stack. They know what they're doing. It's going to cost a premium to get their software stack, but it's easier, it saves time, it's perhaps less headache. If you have really specialized needs, maybe it doesn't make sense, but then you also need the expertise to set up that really specialized set of needs. With this, it's basically plug and play. You plug it in, you set what you want it to do, and you're done. And so like, you know, basic PC backups, like I've got my laptop, I'm always taking with me, it might be lost or stolen at any moment. Basically, whenever the computer's, you know, on the same network and plugged in and you're not using it, it's gonna be backing itself up to the NAS. It's really easy to set that up and that's a great way to uh, store all your backups. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at the DS1821 Plus. Thanks to Synology for sending it over so I could take a quick look at it and sort of beat on the tires a little bit and try to break it. I broke it. But in a good way. It's awesome. Stay tuned for that Anvil video and our 10 gigabit upgrade. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.